Mm. All right, yous. My name's Mr McIver. Or what are you? I started this bar as I'd be up 1921. Everybody thought I was nuts when I first started this place up. Now look at everybody. Everybody's all dafties now. What are they doing? I'm sitting on my ass. What are they doing? They're paying me rent. Who's a dafty now? My name's Julia. I've opened the bar as about 40 here. I know everybody in here. Everybody thinks I'm a cool mum and pop and dodgy. Everybody says I'm the best. These mad job lifters, they always come to me and try and give me a bargain. But one let me half last week, she gave me a dope and she's a hundred and forty pound on it. But I went checked, it was only very quick if I care and I'm gonna do it. Oh yeah, I just have gold mum and so she has. I've seen her before. I share her mad water all the time. She doesn't know who I am, but I know who she is. She steals half my stall, but I know. I sell all the watches and all that. She sells all the copy stuff and I sell all the stuff. Most of my stock it comes for all my shop lifters. I've got about four people lifting for me, but that we guys that gets all the copy stuff. I don't know how she does it. Sometimes she makes spare money in me. She only pays two and three pounds for her two shirts. I pay forty pounds for me. <laughs> the best days are always Christmas. You know, Christmas, you can make two and three grand a day, five days a week. Just as for bacteria, I can shop left the altar. Anyway, she wants anytime. So is Budgers. Get your Budgers here. Cheapest chips. Hi, your Budgers are brilliant. Better than that McDonald's crap anyway. Aye. Never had a complaint once. The Abby Eyes are like, never away for here. She loves my Budgers. So is Budgers. Get your Budgers hot dogs, chips, cans of ginger. Bar sausage, bar tagus, hey, your deep fried Mars bars here. 50 pence, near no beat that anywhere. Iron brew, get your bulls iron brew, free for a pound, there you go, and bring your glass checks back when you're finished, there you go, eh? You'll get that off your next pound fifty supper here. Uh, uh, Oh, never mind the hair zone, that burger, by the way, they're all right, they'll make you stronger, aye. Just get a burger, that means. Aye, I've had this burger for of mine for 20 years and I've never had to clean it once. <coughs> How's about that, aye? Hello, my name's Isa and I'm 82 today. I sell everything for watches. To tobacco, to cigarettes, to clays, to rags. I've worked here for nearly 30 years. I buy the stuff off the shoplifters. That big deal, your man, thinks she's something. But I've got her under the thumb. Well, does she know? Look, look at that big deal, yeah. She's like a man. With her jackets and the watches and that. And her duke. She thinks I'm daft, but she's more in the bend than I'm a. She's more in the me. This is a heart and soul of my life, this banners. I love it. I don't know what I'll do when it goes. The money I make here is unbelievable. I'm going to get my fortune tell later on in the day, before I go to the bingo tonight. See what Mystic Mag's got in store for me. Let's wait and see. Welcome to Mystic Max. I'll tell you your future. Ah, now the spirits come to me. Someone is going to enter into your life. Something is going to happen. Oh, it's coming clearer and clearer. The spirits come to me.
Oh, oh, it's coming to me. I can see. Oh, I sense. I sense. You are going to leave this booth a few pounds lighter. I've been doing this spiritualist treat now for about 20 years. I've got the gift. My mother used to have the gift. My grandmother had the gift. And my great-grandmother had the gift. I do, I do the, the fortune tale and I do the, the, the bowl, I do the palm reading, I do the tarot card, I do the tea leaf, the coffee leaves, the, the leaves off a branch, any, any leaves all day. But see these snobby ones, I just tell them a lot of shite, I'll tell them what they want to hear, tell them they're going to win the bingo or the lottery. The more good news I give them, the more money I take. Ooh. Hello everybody, my name's Schizophrenia Paradafty. I'm outdated here every weekend and traders, but I know birds, shark birds, by the way, I hate that show, the bird fights and everything else. Everybody comes to traders, say my cannons, my cannons has got a good karaoke, but not as good as yet. We are the best karaoke in the Paris. Look at, look at that wee Johnny across here. He thinks he's a brilliant singer. But I can tell you now, he is not You know, everybody comes to see Schizophrenia Paradafty. Because everybody knows, I can say, put him up, put him up. Who's the man? Who's the man? How you doing? I'm PC Plod, and I'm from Glasgow myself. I did a, I, I, I'm your local beat moby, and I, 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 make it, I, I like the barters. They, they always send me down here at the weekends just to make sure that everything's going all right and that. Keep all these shoplifters away and all these fraudsters. I need to keep your eye on that deal, ya. She's always up to any good, sir. She's always getting knocked off gear. I know what she's all about. She thinks I don't know. Aye, I've got mine, her all right. That be Isa. She's a wee con woman. She's got all sorts in that, that bag, so she has pulls out everything. I remember the way the barras used to be, yeah? You never had all these thieves and shoplifters and all this stuff they've got coming and all this copies and crap like that. Aye, ah, I remember when the barras was good. Aye, the barras, brilliant place at the weekend. Brilliant place to take the wains in the family. Aye, you'll not get anywhere else like the barras. Saturday and a Sunday, bring the wains and that down here. Brilliant place. Aye, ah, the barras, you can't beat it. It's a heart and soul of Glasgow, so it is. But when I first started this place up, I started off with a wee barra. Uh, it cost me two and six. I know, I know myself deep down. Everybody will always come to the barras. It's an institution. The barras in Glasgow is an institution. And you'll never, ever, ever beat the barras. Now, all oh, the barras are better, as they say in Glasgow. And you, you actually trust you'll never, ever, ever beat the barras. And I can show you that with all the boat in my heart. Now, skidado. Why do they call you the Varus Queen? Oh, uh, well, the, uh, the only explanation I can give is because we were hiring barras uh, you were hiring before barras. we took over the market. Oh, why? Uh-huh. And, and how... there hundreds of barras. But you've got no barras now, have you? No. You... I have one for their own use. Oh, yes. Now, how old are, are your barras? I mean, uh, the market. This place here, well, wait the new till I see, well, it'll be 29 years anyhow. Uh-huh. And if it's not a rude question, how old are you? I'm uh, 75, as sweet as a nut. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I'm as good as 25. <laughs> I'm a hard nut to crack. <laughs> Thank you.
I can remember having some very, very happy times and having a, a sense of belonging to the place where, where, uh, where I felt part of the scene. Some of the funniest uh, experiences uh, and the, the meeting some of the wittiest people on earth, possibly. Every stall was different. And you could, as, as a true saying, you could get anything from a needle to an anchor. Seeing it through a youngster's eyes, or seeing it through a young person's eyes, what the hell is this all about? What is this all about? I, these people are nuts! Well, there used to be a man that sold the towels, and all these wee... I always remember all these wee ladies, all these wee housewives, used to all gather round the front of them, and all they did, really, was insult every single one of them, and they loved it. And every week, they were back for more. I think it's just a Glasgow thing. People like to get insulted and they think it's funny and they go back for more because they really enjoy it. And it's all, again, about the banter, really, isn't it? Yeah. A £10 note up there. Let me see where you are, girls. We've got a tenner up there. Start. This is your lucky day. Don't get excited, dear. Yeah. I called them Malcolm. Everybody else calls him Malky. I was with him for almost 11 years. He's nearly nine years dead. Everybody wanted to get a pitch next to Malky. Even the coloured people, they went to the pitch, so they'll tell you that they still talk about Malky. You're a peach as well, madam. Peach, a lady there. Peach and the lover's knot. Is that your one, dear? Yes, peach and the lover's knot. Lady on my right. Lady, wait a minute, look. Fascinating. Patrick came away with. Some of the stall holders used to stand with dictaphones to try and get his patter so as they could go home and copy it. But nobody could copy it. Madam, you've said it's from the parish. Lady there, £10. A lady there, £10. Oh, here! I found another one. <laughs> Who wants the last one? <laughs> that was some selling tells. They start off at £40, pound, and you've seen them all coming in with their hands up, honest. And I used to stand back. Oh, <laughs> what, what a salesman. Our main item was the old Bakelite radios, the, the old Valve radios, right? The, the, not sorry, sorry, and these people had never been heard of in these times, but they're all Bakelite radios. And we used to sell them for £1.50, but there was a stall away along the other end of the, the barras who sold them for a pound, and we bought them off them for a pound, and we went and took them back to our stall and we sold them for £1.50. <laughs> there's a painting over there, right? Uh, it's a big Irish guy, and he used to come down and he used to... He would lie on the ground and he, he, he would throw a breeze block and it would burst on his chest, and he used to burst chains. And the next thing he'd be stone up and he'd swallow his start. So, I mean, right into his mouth. It must have touched the base of his stomach, you know? And uh, he used to get everybody on the tour open, he would, he would be pulling. I myself, I about 12, 13 people pulling, and you could, he would pull you on your backside. He was that strong. We called him a strong man. I never ever go to second him. He'd have a big chain in his neck and he could, oh, he could, all oh, the muscles. He was only about this, I mean, four feet ten, if he even was four feet ten. And he can lift a man up in each hand for the ground. He could break these chains. The lassie's eyes used to pop out. Oh, look at his muscles, you know. But he was too wee. <laughs> <laughs> Balancing it on his chin. Like that. A full cartwheel. Aye. Irish paddy. Strong as an ox. Long time ago, the market bought fabulous people. Loads and loads of families. Um, it was a day out, no one else was open on a Sunday. And people came to the Barras because it was a family entertainment day. I didn't see him, but years ago you had the man with the snake and the kids used to come and watch him. You had the man selling the cough mixture. You had the man that opened up his jackets and had 50,000 watches. There was the man throwing the plates up in the air but by the time we came. He used to throw them up and smash them, and then he'd throw them out and shout, who can catch this? And the man throwing out the towels. There was the other chap that used to throw out all the neck curtains. All that spirit and patter and banter made the market. Oh, this is 
I remember it all was being really noisy and very, very busy. You know, it was just mobs of people walking up and down because we were inside because you never got any peace. It was just always incessant talking and, you know, and just people and talking to you. Obviously, you're serving at the stall, so they're just talking to you incessantly and you can, all you can hear is voices and voices and voices. There was another character there. He used to wear tails. He was, about, I think, he was about six feet four. Us, but a big, big, lanky guy, very bony, uh, and uh, he used to wear a top hat, the tails, and his trousers. And he had these big shoes, which were a size too big for him, and he had false teeth in each in each feet. And uh, what he used to do, he used to tap dance. This is true, right, and play the fiddle, the violin. But you could tell his 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 playing of his quality. I mean, he was na no amateur. This guy, you know. I don't ever seen him once. I seen him outside the pavilion once when he was doing a bit of busking out there, you know. Because I used to love watching him because he was so his antiques were his body went with his music, if you know what I mean. And it didn't take long for his hat to, to fill up with pennies, you know. Johnny Cash uh, was uh, also a an authority in tropical fish. And sometimes he was known as John the Fish or John a la Poisson. <laughs> to put the further, that's the French kind of term. But he was a super salesman, very, very... I worked with John on and off for years uh, in the central heating and sales business, and John was probably the best salesman that I'd ever worked or known. A very, very good salesman. They were actors on a stage. Not literally, but that's what it was. The actors are selling their product, for getting people into the into the theatre. He's getting money off the, the audience for his goods. Not only had the stall holders, but as you quite rightly say, you had the street theatres, you had the, the entertainers who walked about. You, know, you had people, they dressed up in various costumes. You had cowboy, you know, folk going about with cowboy uniforms or cowboy, cowboy outfits on, with their guns, you no know, caps in them, as we call them caps, but the old the explosive caps, and them shooting them off. And you had people come through the, the, the barrows on the horseback and things like that as well. There was this carnival atmosphere. <laughs> We go every Christmas Eve to the Barras because that's my l nicest memories. But the atmosphere was incredible, just incredible. It's a ritual that I just like to go back every Christmas Eve and walk round and just, it's lovely. <laughs> When it starts to cut, there's no thick, there's no thin, there's no lumps, there's no bumps, there's no missing fingers. Six for a pint in the hot fresh donuts. Six for a pint in the hot fresh donuts. All your lovely toys and half the shop prices. The reason I went into the banners was because I had two children, and well, they were small then, and I was on my own. So instead of giving my clothes away that I didn't wear, I thought I would yes. try and sell them. So I went into a place in the bar, it's called C-section. Sounds like jail now. <laughs> it's called C-section, <laughs> and that's where everybody sold clothes. And I had a wee stall. And then I built trellis up, and I used to hang all the clothes up. And that's how I got started. And then it just escalated. I went into jewellery and lamps, and I thought, this is great fun, this. Then, I went to a place called the Wash House, which is near Bain Street but underneath. And I set lane. up a stall there with, yeah. with lamps and wee tables and bric-a-brac. And it was just such good fun. Mm. And you met fabulous people. Uh, when I came here, I came down to see the bombing. And the bomb dropped at a chapel. And it burnt a bit, knocked the house down. Tenement building, and that was my introduction to the barrels, and I've been here ever since. 
I've carried coal, I've carried brickets, delivered milk, you name it, I've done it. I used to sell the dollops over on the London Road. Dollops, that means the old clothes, you see. We used to go to Hawking during the week and sell the old clothes, the best of the old clothes over on the market. The chestnut man, do you mind him? Um, oh, man sell chestnuts. It was a foreigner, I don't know. I think he was Italian. And he had to be, it was a barra, and it was a fire, right? But you opened the top up, and you put the chestnuts in, and he just knew when he was ready. And that's where I spent all my money in the chestnuts. It was, all the veins were going for sweeties. I was going for the, I loved the chestnuts. And I used to, when I hadn't any money, I used to stone and just at his stall, at his barra, you know, getting a heat maybe, and he used to chase me, so I'm fed up seeing your face. As a child, I used to go to the barras with my parents, well, with my father. Um, lots of nice people, great banter. As a, as a small child, I, re I remember the man who, I think he, he only had one arm and he used to give bookie tips out and he used to charge everybody a shilling. And they used to queue up and say, you know, oh, there's a man who'll give us the tips and he charged everybody a shilling. I mean, you don't have anything like that nowadays. It's quite unique, let's face it, you know, that you can go out in the street and say to somebody, how about giving me a tip for, for the horses or whatever. But this man did and apparently he was quite good. Apparently there was quite a lot of people who used to win. Seven bob for a dinner place, not expensive, up and went last. There's your dinner place, we'll call that one one. There you have, ladies and gentlemen, your soup plates. Now, if you want to keep a dinner hot, ladies and gentlemen, there's one, there's two, there's lot number three, there is four soup plates. This is the place where the lino was sold just here. The lino sales was just here, and the men who would carry it would be standing waiting for the purchaser. And whenever there was a purchase made, uh, there would be a number of generally unemployed men sort of standing about. And I remember my mum purchasing the lino and a man volunteering and taking it home. And my mum and I walking up the high street with this man carrying the lino behind us. Um, a little Glasgow worthy with this big roll of lino. Uh, for maybe a pound, he would take it home for, you know, but that was quite a common occurrence in these days, you know. The men used to sell the stuff off the back of the lorries. The lorries come in the Friday night and the men sell the stuff off the back of the lorry on the Saturday and the Sunday, you know. Could be new and chalk dolls, you know, chalk statues, plates, linoleum, delf, anything at all, you know. Anything that he could get their hands in. I remember, this was the late 40s, 50s, and the 60s. Very, very busy. Very busy. You couldn't get moving here. You know, it was a pickpocket's nightmare. We're very, very fortunate to have taken over a family business which has been in this East End area for, oh, what is it now, 100, nearly 110 years. But 1903 was when my grandpa opened it and it was only homemade sweets. There wasn't like Cadbury's or anything introduced. And he decided after a number of years when the market opened that he would take a stall there as well. We had quite a few shops in the area and a small factory and my grandpa went round on a Saturday and Sunday to the market, which was exceptionally busy then. Lickman's a sweetie shop, yes. And my mother used to buy candy balls. Candy balls, black stripper balls and cinnamon balls. They were the three favourites, but the candy balls, and it was always two ounce. How crazy is that? Character in the bar was there, he was a wee Indian guy, he used to sit in a wee corner and they, they called him the snake oil man, and he sold his stuff, he used to rub his, his hands were always shiny with this oil, and he would gear with it, and it would blow the heat off it. It would sober you up for a, a weekend's boozing, you know? Snake oil. That's what was in the ointment potion, snake oil. That's what it was. Cos you're talking about he used to now and again have a snake round his neck, I didn't like it.
It was called Cockney Jock, and it was a Cockney. His, his real name was Dick Lee. His, his Cockney accent was fascinating, and he exaggerated it. This pint has painted three quarters of Glasgow. We have used it in three quarters of Glasgow. This paint has been manufactured to the finest degree. Oh, and I'm like, oh, Dick, don't, don't. You know it's a lot of lies, the heckler. Not real paint. So he says, I'll, I'll, I'll let it go. There's no point, because I've got maybe a few hundred. That's a lot of people. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to show you this. I've got a paintbrush, not real paint, the heckler. Prove it's real paint. He says, oh, I've got to stage. He says, obviously, he won't shut up. But whatever the container was, he opened it, walked over to the guy, and poured it over him. And the guy's like, ah. He says, what the hell are you doing? He said, it wasn't real paint, it won't affect you. And the whole place erupted into bellows of laughter. He had just walked off home, and he got on my spiel. Last summer, I sold loads and loads of beautiful little two-handled vases, which were very, very cheap indeed. The lady holding the greyhound, which was a, a marvellous seller, and my pal, the little boy with his doggy pal, and uh, a very, very great seller is the little pairs of wall plaques, beautiful artistic paintings, and hang them up on the walls in pairs. I believe I sold thousands and thousands of pairs of those little figures. I used to play football on a Saturday afternoon. And for me, it was a build-up. Uh, you look, you anticipated it, you look forward to it. And it was like showbiz, because you're dealing with the public all the time. And I enjoyed it. I got a big kick out of going round somewhere and buying something for a tenner. And maybe making a fiver or doubling your money on it. And it wasn't a lot of money. We never made a lot of money, but it was... Well, that's what we're telling you anyway. The baddest <laughs> wasn't for making money. It's a whole social... It was a social thing. Social event. Yeah, yeah. We all went into the pub. Oh, Some of us traded from the pub, oh, actually. That's right. You never were in your place. If you wanted a price for anything from Buddy Quinn, for example, or Raymond, you went to the pub because that's where they were. We used to come down every Sunday. Every Sunday, because that, well, that was my day off my work. And when I was married at first, we and the wife, um, with the Wayne, we used to come down here with my dad. Because my dad, you have down here. And uh, it's a great place to walk about. In the days, there was no Ford's Market, there was no, no of these big supermarket things. It was just, this was just, this was the place to be. If you wanted to buy anything, the bar is that. There's people from England know about the bars. There's people all above to have their bars. <laughs> That's a fact. <laughs> and even at the bar, I say, we had a wee scam going. We cut this wee hole out. Uh, one of the stall holders. In fact, I ended up years later on, his, his son ended up my best pal, but I'm not mentioning his name anyway. What happened is he used to a box and he threw the money in it. So I, I came in during the week and cut a wee hole behind it, and I would stick my horn into it a couple of shillings, and that was me for the for the weekend, you know. So one week, one Saturday, we came in and I, I stuck my horn in, and it was a big size eight book crush my leg. <laughs> What's I doing? I go, you know. But that's the kind of things you, you done when you were a boy, you know, you were it. Then we, we fiddles here and we fiddles there, you know. Quinn's Yard. We st I started off in Quinn's Yard, which was next to the Squirrel Bar. And Bud Quinn organised it all. He he let out to us. There must have been about 20 dealers in there. And Bud traded himself as well as taking rents. And Bud did all his hard work during the week. And he st sat at that bar with a large uh, vodka and lemonade. And people would come through the swing door of the Squirrel. They say, look, bud, hold out a pair of candles, it's £25. Bud just sat there and took money the whole day. It was fantastic. Yeah. Give me the pound, David, give me the pound. I was working the rigs, and I was working with an Aberdeen company, and uh, we were needing tools, special tools for the job. And this guy was wondering where he'd get it. And one of the boys said, you get it in Bill's tool store. The guy said, who's Bill's tool, who's that? He said, that's a shop down at the virus. Sells everything, all the tools. He said, that's what we will do. get one of the boys for bring back next time, that's it. Because it's a well-known place, and as he Bill's tool store, must be the best one in the best place in Glasgow. 
Everybody knows it. Where's he going to? Bow to Ulster. Where's he going to? Bow to Ulster. Well known. Bow to Ulster. Been there for years. In you want. Bow to Ulster. That's for the fact. Opened the shop 1960, November 1960. It's called the Loch Fine Shellfish Bar. And my father got the idea from camping trips, believe it or not. Because people ask me automatically, why Loch Fine? That's a damn good question. The reason is my father camped in the shores of Loch Fine for the best part of 25 years. That was the first time I've had shellfish and it was delivered to the shop and it opened just at the middle of November. And I thought, I cannot cope this. People just flooded in. We didn't know what we were doing. People flooded into the shop. Was, oh my God, what am I going to do? We were shut at two o'clock the first weekend. So I said, um, no, I think the idea is to get better organised, especially, especially with seating. Because there was literally queues down the street. Seeing it through a youngster's eyes, or seeing it through a young person's eyes, and I won't swear, obviously, but what I will say, what the hell is this all about? What is this all about? I, these people are nuts. I said, I thought I was a wee bit different. This, this, this is crazy. How, can they, how are they actually allowed to... If I may quote one from the chat, it's terribly hard to remember 50 years back, but the chap was, I do know, I do know it was very, very loud. I had a microphone, a microphone, very, very loud, and he was actually screaming at the public. I said, how cheeky is that man? That's exactly what the public wanted. I had come from a very posh part of Deniston, and uh, I, I would have to say it was a transformation. A complete transformation because it was just known it just the way it's brought up and quite well spoken that and I guess it's, oh and I was the cut the customers were saying what's this posh accent rubbish I said pardon <laughs> I said I think I'd better adapt here so in Muslim oh, maybe the following year I'm going round I said this has got to be so different and and I, I, what I have to say is. I have to say, I think I'm in the middle sixties, I'd always a fascination for writing. I said, I could write a bestseller about this place. I remember saying that. I would talk of these people as being the characters of the bars, right? So over the years as I grew older, I started doing a wee bit of silly things myself. Now I'll give you, I'll give you an instance of what I did. Uh, it was ideas from these people. It was ideas from these people. I said, Alan, you've got a personality. Why don't you? I said, I said I'm going to be a fool myself. He said, I said, I'm not going to open a store in the bar. He said, no, why don't you do your own love pr promotions from your shop? But go round the bars. I'm not terribly sure. I think it might have been the first. was Molly Malone in Dublin's Fair City. Right? So I got my daughter and her friend dressed up as Molly Malone. And I hired a wheelbarrow, and I'm talking about a wheelbarrow, from the early 1900s, because it was a prop for TV and stage. And I got that, and they get the girls going around, and it was amazing. It was, I didn't have anything to do with it, right? the girls did all the thing. And what we did was, we took out shellfish, and just gave away free, free samples of shellfish, and little gifts to the kids. That was immensely popular. In what they called Quinn's Market, that was really, really genuine. I'm not terribly sure, I'm not 100% sure what the guy bought, but we'll say, we'll see a, a picture, see a picture, and I, I definitely know it was 10 shillings at the time, I know it was 10 shillings, that much I remember, in old money, £25,000 I went from Southbridge in London, £25,000, years later, 10 shillings a pound. I had a customer come in here in the 1960s, um, I forget her name, 1960s, and her grandchildren are now coming in here. Now, to let you understand, Maggie McIver, as you know, was the breadwinner. She was the instigator. She was the brains. As her husband was. Lovely. Very happily married couple, by the way. John and I forget the other John, and there was a there was there was two brothers. One was reasonably clever, and he kept it all going, and the bar land did very well. Uh, but what eventually happened is that it got to a stage, same with me, got a wee bit complacent. Getting cheeky on it. This is licence to print money, don't need to do anything. 
No, I, I think I, I, I definitely. It, it took it took a couple of recessions for me to realise it was automatic. I was going to be making money every week. It took a couple of recessions. I said, "Oops, this is my livelihood." Okay, the kidding on. It's all very well the the, the, the charade. I've been a nutcase and all that. But at the same time, I'm still a businessman. I had to earn a living. So the, the bar the bar did get to a stage that they had to um, they had to change. My name is Arthur McVean and I spent some of the happiest days of my youth at this place to call the Barras. Some of my fondest memories are working here at the weekends with the auctioneers. I was uh, working with some of the sales auctioneers who were selling from the stalls here to the left to the customers in the street. And as they were selling, I was passing the goods to the customers and taking the money and putting it back to the auctioneers. Generally, most families in Glasgow of a new year would purchase a, a roll of lino to, to, to start the new year. And my mother would buy from at that corner, generally on Christmas Eve. And what would happen was there would be a man standing at the corner and he would carry it home for a couple of miles for a pound on his shoulder. He would lift the lino on his shoulder and carry it home for and deliver it. And this would generally be about 12 o'clock at night. But on Christmas Eve, this whole place, it would be a throng of activity and sales. It was bustling, it was a bustling, bustling area, you know. Inside in here was uh, the, the, the snake charmer man who sold uh, the, 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 the snake potions and uh, health potions. An Indian gentleman, a turban gentleman. Um, the snake oils, that type of thing, and herbal, herbal cures he would sell from the inside and all. There was a fishing stall in here where they sold uh, fishing rods for a pound each, and my mother bought me one. It was my first fishing rod for, for one pound, and that's what started me off in fishing. And that was the same all over the place. The, the whole place uh, was where you could get, buy things at reasonable prices. You know, people come down here and they knew they could get things at reasonable prices. And that, that, was, that, would, that would say would be the main attraction for this whole place. The main attraction was people People come down to get bargains and they weren't disappointed. This is where, this is where it all was, you know. Well, when the Jacobite army were stationed in Glasgow in 1745-46, it is reputed that uh, some of the uh, Highland officers, including Cameron of and Lord George Murray, did drink in the Saracen Head Inn, which is on the right here. But that's not in the original site. That's, uh, the, that, that became on the site in 1755. Ten years before it, it was 1755, it was further down the road during that time. And uh, it had been 1745-46. Uh, and Bonnie Prince Charlotte, when he stayed in Glasgow, stayed in the Tontine Hotel, which was in the Tron Gate at the time. You know? And uh, during that period, Glasgow had uh, been asked for 70 pairs, 7,000 7, pairs of shoes and waistcoats and, and and when they refused to, 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 to give out, they offered to the Jacobites were going to burn the city to the ground. And Cameron of Lakeel uh, intervened and saved the city. The shoes, and, the shoes and the waistcoats and the clothing was provided. And every time Cameron of Lakeel comes to Glasgow, the, the bells at the toll booth, which is further down in the high gate, are rung uh, to celebrate his visit to the, to the city. My first involvement in the Barras was in the sort of mid-80s when my friend Tom took over uh, the managership of the, the Barras, uh, Margaret McKay was one of it, and um, because I knew a lot of people in this area, uh, Tom asked me to come in and give him a hand. Well, yeah, uh, Courtney Jock was another amazing character in the, in the Barras, you know, and um, when Tom started as well, he brought in a lot of, um, you know, there was a lot of show, um, a guy that was in stilts, and they used to have that on a Saturday and Sunday, you know, and there was an amazing atmosphere, you know, and people just doing different things. And, and, and you know, that was the thing, when people came here, it was a day, a day out, you know, people came, you know, before all the different markets opened up, like Block Air, and, um, you know, when Glasgow Council realised that, you know, they could open up markets, before all that, the Barris was the original. You know, and, you know, they, they had people in the entertaining, you know, the, you know, and they would have bus, you know, and the car parks were just full of buses, people coming from, you know, as far away as, as Iceland, they used to fly in, 
um, and your bus is here, you know, because stuff was that cheap compared to, you know, and people coming down from Aberdeen and Dundee and all that would come down in buses. Oh, it's, it's changed significantly, you know, um, what, what's happened with markets springing up all over the place, then the, the amount of people that's coming has dwindled, you know, um, uh, and it just, you know, it, it could be doing with just, you know, regenerated. Right. And I think it's such an asset for Glasgow that, you know, really they have to get their heads together and, and see what they can do to, to sort of, you know, rejuvenate, you know, because it works elsewhere, you know, in London, you know, and especially now with, um, you know, the, the population in Glasgow changing, the ethnic community, you know, we need to try and encourage that, you know. Um, and, and uh, you know, I think there should be, you know, more things, you know, catering for the ethnic community as well, you know. and. Uh, you know, making it really into like a market again, you know, um, and, and I know it's, you know, you know, people are, are saying it's finished and all that. I don't agree with it. You know, I, I, I'm really optimistic that with a, a, a bit of thought that we can regenerate the bars again and you know something, you know, the standing it should have in the community, you know. And there's a lot of really hard, hard, hard working people yeah, here. Yeah. There's people who have put their kids through university by yeah. taking a bar stall. And there's a wee lady across the road that Rina. has a fruit stall. She's Rina, she's been here for years and she's put all her kids through uni. Yeah. And she works really hard, doesn't she? And she gives mm. great prices for her fruit and her veg and everything. You can get great bargains. But really, yeah. just, they're really salt of the earth people. They really kind of take, it's like a family, and they take you into their family when you come in. They either like you or they don't yeah. like you. Fortunately, they've kind of accepted us. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, they've been really helpful, and they look out for you. You know, like they watch the shop, and they keep an eye that everything's safe for you, because mm -hmm. like every area you get problems. But they have done a wee with Paddy's Market. I mean, they have just cleared that out and that's a shame because that was a tradition as yeah, well absolutely. and it would be a shame to see the bar is going because that would be it's like clearances it's as almost as though we'll clear these people out and we'll bring in like nice posh flats and everything but people need to mix and there's a sense of community about here well, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic you know i think um especially with the uh, the games going to happen in in uh, uh 2014 and I believe there are, there are going to be improvements about the Gala Gate, you know, they're, 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 uh, which can only be good. Uh, I think it's going to bring, I think it's an opportunity for us here to, to let, you know, all the, the people who are coming into the games to see what we can do. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to selling loads of muscles because I believe there's going to be, you know, lots of Europeans coming over. And we're hoping to have a sort of cafe. You know? And I know from, you know, the, the fish and chip shop across the road there, it's one of the most amazing fish and chip shops out, you know, the quality of the stuff here, you know, but people think it's the bars, they're not going to get boy. They should really look and see. And come down and pick the stuff and look at it. And it's the same way in here, try it before you buy, you know. It's marvellous. And we as a family, you know, we're committed to, to here now, you know, and um, we just, you know, I just love working in this and I love my family being next to us in it, you know. And I think, should, I think that's what we need to encourage, more families to have businesses. I was born at Kensington, we looked to the windy night, it's paddy, he used to change his cell up, you know, we change suits and regularly sell up them and all that, you know. He tried to sell up one day and somebody stole his money. Look at the money. Ah, you bet it, Stole his money. You bet it, by the heart you chipped in. So he put you sell him a straight jacket this time. And he couldn't get fucking out. He just liked money and bull people. You bet it, Clark. He stole a bit, wasn't it? He put the padlocks on. They didn't know, they, they put something in the paddle and they couldn't get a key in to get, you know. <laughs> Somebody stole them. Matt, Matt and Amara, get Matt and Amara. I think Charlie was there. He, 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 started, he started off with he, just a thing, he knew you threw the stuff up and he caught it and did that, you know. So he said, no, you fucking learning that for, he's coming out your wages, Matt. Gert says, I'm good at this. Gert says, oh, what a fucking tea set. <laughs> what tea set in the truck? You sneak oil by you rub stuff in your hand and you nearly rub you out and stuff, you know. <laughs> you see for coals now, you used to rub stuff in your hand.
So I brought a brown suit and black shoes, I couldn't afford them. So I went down and he they done them all brown. So it fucking rained and all the stuff came off the shoes. <laughs> <laughs> I fucking turned black again. You remember that? My mum was a hawker, that mum was a hawker, you know. My mum was a hawker, you know. The dollars you got, you earned them up, cheap you put them on. I had a pair of short trousers and I was 14 going to school. They only had a lot of money, they just came up. They went on the bar, she just started with a couple of stalls across facing Bird's bar. I mean, she's. What's it like? What do you call her, Maggie? Okay, well. She's. Bird's bar in the galley. She just started across the trousers, that's where she started, we got a land there. That's where the bar was built up. She's just a hawker. Just a hawker, that's how she built it up, and they finished up with this. She bought the stalls and put the stalls. My mum used to be on you. She's on the bar land, that's where she bought it. Finished up with the bar land, but not the bar land at all. I think it was a tanner for a tanner or something for a weekend for the stall there. I think it was about 30, 40 quid, wasn't it? <laughs> I mean, he, he went to Las Vegas with a Celtic rally in 2003. And I was sitting beside the guy, he said, I says, from Glasgow. He said, near the bar, I said, just around the corner. That, that, that was American. Near the bar, I said, you been? He says, no, but I heard about it. Did you know? Cheap bars of buns. Uh, eccentric bars, you know. So when we, we John got up to the corner and he says, where do you got? He said, we're doing the bars. He says, get something for the tea when you're out. Get back a teapot. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, don't like my bags, see the black bags you get. I mean, see the black bags. Uh, see the first guy ever sell them. Clams Campbell sold them at the bar at the first. Just, maybe they'd ever seen them before. Clams had a big, these black bags. Well, bin bags. Bin bags. They sell them for the shelves. Shelves are the go. Pass them as three days. They sell them these black bags. They buy black bags. They buy them off at Clams. They sell these ones, they sell them. That's the game. I've never seen a black bag. You know, so that's how long ago. Before the black bag, but clans were saying, well, it's very good and we never said it yet. That's what I'm saying, that's what we... I used to buy them off the clan, guys. That was, that was very, must be. Uh, 40, wasn't it? 40. Oh, 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 see Tommy Barnes' show. Oh, oh, Tommy Barnes' oh, show. Oh, oh, Next day, the... Next day, the chap show. He, 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 he's a good kid, he's evil kid, but I think we're hanging with John. We all John. 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 There's only enough room to get in and walk to the... If you say to Tommy, give me a, give me a pack of needles, Tommy. Oh, Tommy, right up the ladder. Pack of needles. He don't think with the, the four forks. He don't think with the four forks. Oh, yeah. <laughs> two, the two Ronnies. Two Ronnies. Two Ronnies. <laughs> He was even he was funnier than the April's driver. This Tommy man, he had a right score on brown coat. And if you see him, Tommy, he, somebody thinks he's Tommy got an anchor. Oh, don't a minute. Fucking drag this big anchor. What do you think? It doesn't matter what size a screw or anything. You want any of a bite or anything? The toy had it. You could anywhere at all. People came from all the world. As a child, we used to go to the barracks with my parents, well, with my father. Um, lots of nice people, great banter. As a, as a small child, I, re, I remember the man who, I think he, he only had one arm, and he used to give bookie tips out, and he used to charge everybody a shilling um, for his tips. And there was an, also another man who sold blood mixture, tonic, make you feel good. And it wasn't until I grew up and I realised that all those years ago, it was quite incredible, that guy owned a yellow Rolls Royce. And he sold blood mixture at the Barris. The Barris was always great fun, all the latest toys you used to get at the Barris and happy, happy times. And I remember my father being there every Christmas Eve and lots of other people being in the same position, that if you weren't able to buy it at Christmas Eve for your children's Christmas, and there was many children didn't get anything. And that was the thing about the Barris. If your child really wants something, if you go to the Barris, wait till Christmas Eve, till, you know, Christmas, and they just give everything away, in fact, and they did. If you bought something, there was a particular man there called Harry, and everybody went to wee Harry that sold the toys, and you would wait at the end of the day, at the end of the night, he would say, right, okay, who bought this, who bought that, put that in for your child's Christmas, and he threw out lots of things for free, and that all added to the excitement of your Christmas, because you were getting something extra, not just that one wee doll that your parent had stood all night in freezing cold to get. To, well, there used to be a man that sold the towels, and all these wee, I always remember all these wee ladies, all these wee housewives used to all gather round the front of him, 
and all he did really was insult every single one of them, you know, um, and he loved it. And every week they were back for more, and they just, it just, I think it's just a Glasgow thing. People like to get insulted, and they think it's funny, and they go back for more because they really enjoy it, and it's all again about the banter, really, isn't it? Blackman's a sweetie shop, yes, and my mother used to buy candy balls, candy balls, black stripper balls, and cinnamon balls. They were the three favourites, but the candy balls, and it was always two ounces. How crazy is that? Two ounces of candy balls, two ounces of uh, cinnamon balls, and they used to all be wrapped in these separate paper bags. And my mother's favourite actually was candy balls, and she used to hide them. <laughs> I remember she used to get all the different ones, but she, she used to hide the candy balls so we couldn't get them because they were her favourite. Glickman's was just great. Sewer plumes, all these sweeties. Um, fantastic, absolutely fantastic. Yeah, and I said one day, why don't we get a stall at the Barris for a laugh? And my husband, well, he, at the time we were engaged, he didn't, he's ne he'd never been to the Barris, only on a sightseeing tour. And I said, why don't we get a stall at the Barris? It would be great fun. And he thought, it was so ridiculous. So it ended up that a couple of our friends, one opened up a kind of wool stall and another one was selling baked potatoes at the Barris. And we went up one weekend to pop up and see them. And we thought, oh, let's, get, let's go and find out how much it is to get a stall. So we went to find out how much it was and it was £12.50 a weekend. Yeah. We were only there for about three months or something. But those three months, we met a lot of nice people. In fact, when I when I go to the Barris now, I know quite a few of the people still there, and particularly the gentleman that sells the flowers, and he's a real character, real character. Um, I, uh, him and a lady called Jean, you know, they've been there for absolutely years. These people were so hardy, how they could be there so early in the morning, every weekend, you know, to, to so late in the afternoon, and it makes you realise these people work so hard to earn a living. Well, I think I think at the end of the day, I feel that the Barris will fizzle out. And I think it's very sad because I think that a lot of tourists that used to come to Glasgow, their trip to Glasgow wasn't complete unless they had a trip round the Glasgow Barris. My other uncle, Big Pat, he was well known in the Kilton, everywhere. He was the biggest fruit hawker in Glasgow. That's all he ever dealt in was fruit. Made a fortune out of it, drank his shell out of it, gambled out of it, came back, done it again. And as I say, they left school at 14, the education, but they, were, they, were, they made a lot of money for themselves. They knew what to do, and that was it. Well, in the bar, is one of the best sales was in the bar, I don't know if anybody will tell you, if something anybody talked to you, was Robert McNamara. Well, right, we're just right through that wall there. That was his stall. His wife sold the, the curtains straight through the back of a van just on the street. He sold there, and uh, Robert could sell anything. Though, no, honest, he was, he was such a good salesman. He, he, it was unbelievable. Uh, he was, well, he went to my auntie before they got married. Uh, just like an uncle to me. That was my dad's best pal. And, uh, he, he was the funniest man I've ever seen in my life. He part of him was brilliant. When he left the, when he left the sale, the sale in the, the, the store in there, he worked with a guy for doing a bit here that sold all the carpets. I don't know if they told you his name. Big Alec, he sold uh, all the carpets. He, he was a millionaire. That was his game. So Robert ended up going to work for him as a carpet salesman. And then uh, 50 years ago, his name was Abadou. And he used to stand at the corner, around the corner. He had a briefcase. And this was all full of bottles. And this potion had, you know, this potion, I think they, and it was a snake oil or something, whatever they called it. This could cure anything. Anything at all, you, you name it, this done it for a half a pound a bottle. So people used to stand and watch them. You say, Rob Ori Seal, they tell you, this, with any ailments you've got, half a crown and this will cure it. And he stood about the score for years and years. Don't know ever what happened to him, but he's away now. I'm going back, as I say, 50 years ago. It was the first black man I've ever seen. Johnny Cash, Johnny Cash sell the towels. When he left here, he went to the SECC with the market down there. Well, Johnny, that was all Johnny Dunn was buying sale. Tills, tills. He, he went there, he went everywhere selling these tills. I love it. I, I work here every day of my life. I'm in the Carlton every day of my life. I love it. You, people just you, people you couldn't hear Christmas because Christmas time was no place home to 12 o'clock at night. And if you wanted, if, if, you, if there was somebody you hadn't bought for, forgot about, this was the place to be because it's home to 12 o'clock.
And then after 12 o'clock, just the gave stuff made it cheaper and cheaper. And as you go nearer 12 o'clock, things started getting cheaper to get rid of it. And that was it. So the moths and dads would come down here with the kids to buy them. So it's a great place to walk about. Late, in the days, there was no Ford's market. There was no, no of these big supermarket things. It was just, this was just, this was the place to be. If you wanted to buy anything, the bars. There's people from England know about the bars. There's people all over the world have their bars. I got involved in the bars. Uh, my uncle Wally, Wally O'Donnell, he introduced me to this wee Jewish fella. So what happened was, uh, I was only maybe about 11 at the time, 10 or 11, and uh, he would give me a shilling a day, like, you know, and, and then up to uh, two shillings, you know, for what I used to watch his stall run for his tea. And I was still uh, in the bars to about the, the 60s, and uh, my uncle Wally used to go to this guy called Jimmy the Cobbler. He was a friend of his, like, you know, Cobbler. He came for the the Cowcaddens district, Raglan Street, earning well, about half a crown for the weekend, which was no bad money, you know, concern, you know. But I used to push Jimmy the, the Cobbler's bar at home. Uh, all the way up Hope Street. It wasn't it a, a, maybe four or five months when I was working with Jimmy? I said to myself, I wonder why Jimmy doesn't bring a bar. He, he brings it down to the bars, he doesn't get me to bring it down, but it was all downhill. It took me a while to think of that, you know. I was doing the, the hard labour, pushing, pushing it up to his store in Kikadden, you know. I was in the bars there two and a half, three years ago before I packed in. I was walking home with £6 some weekends and I had £70 for the weekend's rent to pay. And people think, People think you're, you're making mega bucks, but you're not really, you know. Well, I was selling the uh, jewellery and bric a brac and, and my own paintings. I discovered the, I was painting behind, I was doing a wee drawing behind the stall one day. This guy went by and he went, Chris, that's silver good, mate. He says, What you want? And I sold him it. And uh, I said, I think I'll start doing my paintings. So I started doing my paintings. A, few, a lot of people were collecting my work, you know. But uh, the type of work I'm doing uh, in the bars, it, it's, it's a bit. Uh, it's not really for the bars market, you know. You're not really getting the, the, the right clientele for it in the bars, you know. So as I was saying, I was in the bars uh, and uh, I think it was in 02 and my stall got broken into and uh, all my jewellery got taken, all my good rings and all my good watches, you know. And that was about six, seven years worth of work. Basically, I chucked it, sickened me all together after after bars. But the bars, the bars is it's, it's a great institution. It always always will be. But but where it's not the bars that will change it. It's the people that's changing now. There's too much. Uh, kids are losing interest in collecting things that years ago you used to go and they collect the beanos and dandies and or comics and things like that, and toys, toy soldiers and. Uh, be dinky cars and things like that. People collect paintings, but to me, people are not interested in that. Now. There's a lot of characters. There's a painting over there, right? Uh, it's a big Irish guy, and he used to come down and he used to, he would lie on the ground and he, he, he would throw a breeze block and he would bust on his chest and he used to bust chains. And the next thing he would stand up and he'd swallow his sap. So, I mean, right into his mouth. He must have touched the base of his stomach, you know? And he uh, used to get everybody on a tour open, he would, he would be pulling. I myself, I about 12, 13 people pulling, and you could, and he would pull you out on your backside. He was that strong. We called him a strong man, I never ever got his second name. And there was another character there, he used to wear tails. He was, I think he was about six feet four, us, but a big, big, lanky guy, very bony. Uh, and uh, he used to wear a top hat, the tails, and his trousers. And he had these big shoes, which were a size too big for him. And he'd false teeth in each in each feet, and uh, what he used to do, he used to tap dance. This is true, right? And play the fiddle, the violin, and it didn't take long for his hat to to fill up with pennies, you know. And there was another character in the bar as there. He was a wee Indian guy. He used to sit in a wee corner, and they they called him the Snake Oil Man. And he sold his stuff. He used to rub his his hands were always shiny with this oil, and he would give a whiff it, and it would blow the heat off. It'd sober you up for a weekend's boozing, you know. And uh, there was another old guy there, my uncle Wally knew him quite well and all, the, the chestnut one, he would, he had this wee stove. He would sell uh, chestnuts and uh, he had a wee kind of, like a barbecue thing on wheels, you know. And uh, I'm trying to think now, there's that many, over the years there's been that many characters in the bars, you know. There was another guy there, he used to sharpen knives, he'd a, a pedal bike thing. This is in the fifties again, you know, sixties. He would pedal this bike and sharpen up the thing, you know. 
and uh, you always had bike sellers at every corner, guys would be selling bikes, and my Uncle Willie, he would have about half a dozen watches up each chair. And you, you learnt your trade in the barras, you know, I mean, there was a lot of good people and a lot of bad people, you know, but it's no that... Uh, no, to me, the, the people both change, you know, it's it's a different setup all together, you know. It'll always be there in people's hearts and minds, you know. Uh, it's it's one of the institutions, I don't think it'll die out all together, there'll always be something to David the Barland, you know. I've been writing about for years and all, I don't know how to get about publicised, I was thinking they call them the tiaras at the barras, you know. Well, we're very, very fortunate to have taken over a family business which has been in this East End area for 1903 was when my grandpa opened it. So we're, we're coming up for 107 years in the one place and it's been amazing the things that have gone on from the horse and cart outside to the sheep going down the lambs pass to the bar has been round the corner every year there's something different happens. But going back to the beginning, my grandpa opened this shop then and it was only homemade sweets. He didn't have, there wasn't like Cadbury's or anything introduced. He decided after a number of years when the market opened that he would take a stall there as well. My grandpa went round on a Saturday and Sunday to the market, which was exceptionally busy then. He used to take his homemade macaroon cake, tablet, candy balls, all the homemade sweets. And we were well known in the area for his famous cough tablet. Cough tablet w w really became famous when the war was on because it was for medicinal purposes and you didn't need a ration book. So you could buy the cough tablet without any rations and they used to queue up down the street for it. Business increased when the market started because long time ago, the market bought fabulous people, loads and loads of families. Um, it was a day out, no one else was open on a Sunday. And people came to the Barras because it was a family entertainment day. And it was a day that the family could enjoy. Years ago, I didn't see him, but years ago you had the man with the snake and the kids used to come and watch him. You had the man selling the cough mixture. You had the man that opened up his jackets and had 50,000 watches. Um, this is all sort of carried. My dad used to tell us all about this. And my grandpa was part of that with his tablet, macaroon cake. And it was absolutely just mobbed. It was really, really, really busy. Ina. Ina still comes round. I haven't seen Ina for a wee while. Mm. Um, she sold the paperback books round there in the stand. Now, she has been there, oh, I would say, what, at least 40 years that I can remember. There's a lot of the old timers are still there. And it it's, just needs the laughter, as I said, brought back in. Yeah. Once the laughter's back in, um, it'll make a big, big difference to it. And we had we have some very fond memories, um, even my uncle with the candy floss. I think the area changed about 10 to 15 years ago. I think the generation changed. And I think that... Shopping centres. Shopping, uh -huh, the generation changed. That spoiled the market a little bit. And the weather's so bad here as well. The, uh -huh. uh, the rain on a Saturday or a Sunday, um, people would want to go in, inside Indoors, to but it was warm the and shopping and centres. Warm. And I think that didn't help it. There's lots of wee bits that didn't help, but I think the generation as well, the old man with the plates got older, the snake man was long gone, the man with all the watches was no longer there. Things that you couldn't help but watch, you were drawn to because the banter is good and the Glasgow patter is good and I quite enjoy that. There's not enough of that today and that's what's missing. But again, it's because of the generations. Christmas Eve at the Barris. Even as much as I say it, George Bowie always makes comment on it. Well, if you're needing a pair of socks, you've got till midnight. 
because uh, up to midnight on Christmas Eve, you can't move. The Barras on Christmas Eve is like it used to be. It's absolutely solid. It's fabulous. Mm -hmm. We stay open to midnight every Christmas Eve. So does everybody else. And a few years ago, um, there was a chap had the Barra's Bar when it was open and he went round to the market and he got them to shave off half of his beard. See, this is what the Barra's is needing. And he kept saying to everybody, put money in for York Hill. And everybody was filling up his buckets and then they went away to York Hill with the money and he put up a big notice saying that he donated it. But he shaved off half the big grizzly beard and it was fun it was what they needed a bit of life and entertainment and they had carol singers coming to draw attention all that brings the people i met malcolm i called them malcolm everybody else calls him malky i was with him for almost 11 years he's nearly nine years dead he was the top auctioneer anywhere he went to he was auctioneer, they sold everything out completely. People always wanted to be next to him, all this, the people with the stalls, because he sold everything out. He, was a, he could sell sand to the Arabs. He had the patter of um, start off with a box, a wooden box, a cardboard box in front of the stalls and then um, he would have maybe an odd couple of hand towels in it. Uh, yellow dusters, big bath towel and the bath sheet and they'd see the people coming by and say put that in the box Margaret, put that in the box. I don't care what I get for it, could get a pound or maybe 50 pence. Come on in, come on in. So let's see the bargains then. So of course they used to go in and it was, put your hand up, who's got a pound? And they'd pull out a towel, a big bath towel or a bath sheet. Then you see them all say, oh I've got a pound, I've got a pound. And they'd come into the stall and he'd say, hold on, hold on, you'll see what you'll get a bargain. And he'd say, right, who, who's got a pound for this? And he'd say, oh yeah, take it for nothing. I'm not going to charge you 40 pounds. I'm not even going to charge you 30 pounds. Come on in. Who's interested? What colour would you like, dear? You know, you would like peach and you would like blue. And I'm putting up the bundles and putting the hands up and, and all the colours with that. And of course, they put their hands up and they say, Did I say 20 pounds? No, I mean 20 pounds. Five, 19, 18, 17, or 16. What colour would you like, madam? Take two sets. One will do your granny. Or one will do your auntie. That wee woman's bought five sets. She's got a tail. She's got a tail in the noon. Her arm's rusty. Right, and have I said 15 pounds? No. No. 14, 13, no, even 12 pounds. Come on, get a bargain. Did I say 12? No, even 12. No, even 11. In fact, no, even a tenner. Get your hands up. If you can't get your hands up, get your bloody feet up. Put your leg up. <laughs> See? All right, you're right. Everybody else seems to want more sets. Put a tenner up there. 9 99 There you go. <laughs> Tell me some sell these tools. They start off at 40 pounds. And you've seen them all coming in with their hands up. Honest. And I used to stood like, oh. <laughs> What, what a salesman, really fantastic salesman. Why, he's, he was in the bar in, in that trade, plus he'd done uh, curtains and netting and things with his stepfather when he was 12. And then he, he started mostly when he was 18. But he was in the bar for about four, all round the trade for about 40 years. I was born in Kent Street at the bar and my father was born there up number 41. And when Maggie McIver had it, oh, it was absolutely, you had the Irish man, they, they used to put stones, big slabs of stones in his chest, and you threw a penny in, and you get a big mallet, and half it in his chest, and then you had the people in the street shouting, there you are, tana, it's a tana da bun, a tana da bun. It was brilliant, but now, it's changed now. But the, then, oh, everything was, every stall was different. And you could, as, as a true saying, you could get anything from a needle to an anchor. Anything at all. There was a wee character, it was Malcolm's best pal, and he's called James McNamara. And he used to wear a bowler hat with an elastic band around it, 
the pound notes sticking out it. And he used to sell shoes and dishes, the same as Malcolm, they had their hand in it, everything. This guy came up one day and bought shoes and went away home to where I think it was Dundee or somewhere out there. And he came back in the next week and he says, hey, do you need to change your shoes for me? And me and Mac and me Gallus, it was only five feet. He says, hey, what do you mean that you change the shoes? He says, you've gave me one that's got laces and one that you slip on. And we James went, what does it say in the box? And the man looked at it, he says, Taiwan. He says, well, you can Taiwan. <laughs> we James's pattern was like that as well. And his brother, he used to do that as well. And he dropped dead in Beard's Bar. We, we James McNamara. He deserves a wee mention because he was a character, James. He sold netting and shoes and in Taiwan. I mean, everybody was in fits. Everybody was in fits. He knew all the show people, he knew all the gangsters. Arthur Thompson and all them, and he was well in with them, because they all loved him. Because he would say no to anybody. That's it. But that's Malcolm. The MacIvers had a stable in Clifford Street. I'd been in the bar as my mum and I, and I'd worked with that John Bull. Now, my mother had gave me a wee fruit shop in the Neaton Street in Bridgeton. I told her, and I says, I wish I could get a pitch at the Barras, you know. And it was the Barras that had to mobbed, you know. So she says, come on, I'll take you along and see Sammy McIver. Right. He sell the cars under the bar line, right? Now, I went into the market, I had nothing to sell. So I had bought 20 case of apples. Sturmers. They came from Tasmania, right? So I had bought 20 cases, one in six a case for 140 apples, right? I took them up to the bar as I gave my wife ten and I went away doing a course selling ten and oranges and all that else I bought. And I came back at six o'clock at night and I said, how did you go on with April? She said, I was finished at twelve o'clock in the day part. So I went to the guy I bought them off of, and I've got a wee thing on the street where a steel hatch thing chap to steel hatch, it was right at the top of Albion Street, you know, and it was a wee fella called Smith. I said, have you any of the apples left? Does Tommy got any of the apples left? He said, no, he sold, sold them a little and like him. What the F do you want? He says, who are you? I said, Pat Kane. He said, I never heard of you. Right. I said, I'll tell you what it was. I was looking for the apple that Tommy so-and-so had. He says, I said, I paid one and six for him. A case, you're no getting them at F and one and six, you're getting them at two and six. I said, Minnie, have you got, he said, 150 cases. Only about 20 quid. So, I said, OK, I'll take him. So my brother-in-law, he was also in the fruit game, but he was working for his sister, Carmichael, and he, he says, well, that's great, Pat, I'll take 20. Right, I charged him a half a crown, and I guy outside, I'll take 20 and all. Five shillings I charged him, right. And I got the rest on the motor and up to the barras. You had been only about a couple of months in the barras. And I had my wife, her sister, her brother. My own brother was 14 years of age, Tam Ward's wife. 
My motor driver had lost my, le my license. Ovi Henderson stayed up the stairs for me. So I go to to I'd near the stuff, and I gave him the hammer that he took a wire off of, you know. And I got 18 cases opened up and I stood them up that way against the stall, you know. Five for a shilling. Cure mile bone. Silk the lot. Irish paddy. Right. You shall have the big care wheel when you see. I was only a boy, you know, at the time. And he said, now come on, chain me up and hang me, you know. These three guys went to the shop and bought different padlocks. <laughs> you couldn't get, they were hee-hawing and laughing, you know. But he, he was strong. We well, cat wheel right in the chin. Big, funny big cat wheels, you know. Irish paddy. Strong as an ox. <laughs> he he was genuine, you know. But he used to have to get a open air, you know. He uh, throw shillings and tanners and truck me bits and that. Once he got a pound, right? Money time me up, right? But he lifted the money fucks. First time I, first time I met Maureen, I actually walked into a shop in Bain Street, and there was sort of military downstairs, and there was a, an elevated bit. I went upstairs, and I couldn't believe my eyes. The place is so well organised, uh, very much like what you see here just now. Yeah. And it was little boxes, little co compartments, because she's a fantastic interior designer. And uh, later on, a couple of years later. I get Maureen into my shop, London Road, uh, London Road Antique Centre, and she organised things. And just by fate, she's ended up down at Lansfield Street, and she's still playing at houses. Is that right, <laughs> yes. <laughs> do we look like antique dealers? <laughs> I was probably round about the, the same time, the 1980s, and the reason I went into the barras was because I had two children, and, well, they were small then, and I was on my own, so... Instead of giving my clothes away that I didn't wear, I thought I would try and sell them. So I went into a place in the bar, it's called C-section. Sounds like jail now. <laughs> it's called C-section, and that's where everybody sold clothes. And I had a wee stall. And then I built trellis up, and I used to hang all the clothes up. And that's how I get started. Then, once my own clothes were finished, I started buying clothes from other people and selling them, obviously, at a profit. And then it just escalated. I went into jewellery and lamps, and I thought, this is great fun, this. Then I went to a place called the Wash House, which is near Bain Street, but underneath. And I set lane. up a stall there with, yeah. with lamps and wee tables and bric-a-brac. And I worked beside a, a man called Jimmy, wee Jimmy, who sold, well, he said he sold Chittendale chairs. <laughs> <laughs> they were more like the Chittendale dancers, I think. He used to say he had Chittendale chairs. Did he not and mean was, chips off the chairs? Ah, no. probably. Chips probably. off the chairs. And it was just such good fun. Mm. And you met fabulous people. And I just sort of kept going. I had other work in between that. And this was my sort of hobby work. It was just... Can well, you say I, it was fun? It was well, I found that it was like, I used to play football on a Saturday afternoon, and for me it was a build-up. You look, you anticipated it, you look forward to it, and it was like showbiz, because you're dealing with the public all the time. And I enjoyed it, I got a big kick out of going round somewhere and buying something for a tenner, and maybe making a fiver or doubling your money on it. And it wasn't a lot of money, we never made a lot of money, but it was, well, that's what we're telling you anyway. The baddest wasn't <laughs> for making money. It's a whole social. It was a social thing. Social event. Yeah, yeah. We all went into the pub. Oh. Some of us traded from the pub. Oh, actually, that's right. You never, but in your place, if you wanted a price for anything from Buddy Quinn, for example, or Raymond, you went to the pub because that's where they were. Quinn's Yard. We st I started off in Quinn's Yard, which was next to the Squirrel Bar, and Bud Quinn organised it all. He 
he let out to us, there must have been about 20 dealers in there, and Bud traded himself as well as taking rents. And Bud did all his hard work during the week, and he st sat at that bar with a large uh, vodka and lemonade, and people would come through the swing door of the squirrel, and they say, look, Bud, hold up a pair of candlesticks, 25 pounds. Bud just sat there and took money the whole day. It was fantastic. Then with the cartwheel, James McGinn used to run the cartwheel. And he was a scrap dealer, James McGinn. And he used to bring out all the sort of metal bits, you know, uh, candlesticks, you name it. All the dealers used to queue up on a Saturday morning. Brought through all this stuff from Kilmarnock. That's where the scrap metal place was. Oh, Ronnie Bridges. Ronnie Bridges. Ronnie Bridges. Uh, Great garage. Yeah. He started bringing in jukeboxes yeah that's right and all this americanized stuff and petrol pumps yeah, and petrol yeah, pump yeah then the big gigantic horse yeah that he rented out he, he, he had a yellow cadillac didn't he yeah he had a yellow yep. cadillac this was taxi. all in the barras yeah it was really really colorful yeah uh, you, you don't get that now that's ronnie's now a playwright come actor and he's yeah. he's writer as well in the in the uh, the street parlour to Stevenson Street West. I, I've forgotten the name of the so street. I don't, can't but there was, there was a guy there. He used to shout out the price of butcher meat, and all the hands would go up. And then at Christmas, around the Christmas and New Year, you had the spielers shouting out their wares. But basically, at the weekend, it wasn't happening. I don't remember it from when I, I was there. It was when I, I used to go when I was a wee girl that they were there, but they were gone by the time. And that, that's from about the 80s onwards, that's, I would say. That's when it started to change, the whole way of trading yeah, yeah. changed. And although people used to come in and say it's not the same as it was, it, it couldn't be the same as it was because the, the people, the buyers that were coming after that didn't want that. They, they wanted the way it was going, uh -huh. the way it was turning into the other parties. The one really good party was the one where Tam the Hat was going away. And we were all in there and somebody put something in the cakes. <laughs> somebody did the catering. And somebody <laughs> found, did the catering? Oh, Fiona. Did, did she? Oh, yeah, Oof. you should talk to Fiona. Fiona did the catering. See, that's the first half you heard of this. Yeah, and obviously there was something in the cakes and I wasn't used to this. I don't know if everybody else was. But when we were, all, we were, in, when we well. were all in the square yard, uh, whether you worked, worked in the square yard or not, when Anna had it, after we were finished, the squirrel bar was across the road, so we actually used to take the pints you across. You just put your drink and went to the square yard and we all and, sat and, out. And a, and a nice sunny, in the sunny evening, it was great, you just sat back and relaxed. But that night was hilarious because mm. everybody was legless. We all decided then we would dress up in the clothes that somebody else had left that they were selling. So all the girls went in there, stripped off and put on different clothes. Ah, that's right. Flapper dresses, that's remember? Right. Weird outfits. Yeah. But I don't think they should ever do away with the Barrows. I think the city needs the Barrows in a different forum. My gran Mary Hutton was a uh, Maggie McIver's buddy, like pals, they were always together. And they decided to, they were looking for the market or to start the market. So they started, it was stables in Kent Street. I, I believe Tony, it was Tony Davison had his fruit thing in there at the time and that was where the stables were so they used to go in the night before and scrub it all out but they start the barras and the, I suppose it would be the Saturday and Sunday. And my mother, she was Mary Eliza, eh, her and her, all her sisters and brothers all had a stall at the barras. The other year she kind of bettered herself, where first it was patch mats they started making and uh, they would come to the barras and see what they wanted. And if they had any of the money, Mama had a tick book and they'd pay five pound, eh, five shillings or a half a crown till they, were, they had that paid and then they could collect it. And it was wrapped up in newspaper and a big string. <laughs> so she went for making them, but she was still selling the old clothes on the barras as well and the old shoes. and whatever came along and then she graduated for there and went into making a uh, doll's dresses and it, she would go in the barras collecting all the fancy ballroom 
gowns and ripping them up and then she would go to Remlet Kings and buy material to match all these trimmings and make the fancy ballroom dresses for the dolls. And just before Christmas, about October time, the people were coming from Australia and Canada and America or to get their orders for Christmas to take back home, you know. So you were getting an education all the time and you knew who to be wary with. You know, you got to know the uh, types of people you shouldn't have been near and things like this. It was a great education. I mean, so I was nearly born in the barrows. I never got around to that bit. It was in the middle of the war, 1943. How I remember Maggie McIver was, she used to come up to my granny's all the time. This one man at the bottom of Minkur Street, the chestnut man, do you mind him? Oh, Mansell Chestnuts. He was a foreigner, I don't know. I think he was Italian. Irish Paddy, the strong man, he had to have a big chain around his neck and he could, oh, he could blow the muscles. He was only about this, I mean, four feet ten, if he even was four feet ten. And he can lift a man up in each hand for the ground. He could break these chains. And he would get rocks, big rocks, and he would tie one on, well, he wouldn't tie, he would put the, the chain round them and lift them up, oh God, the muscles. The lassie's eyes used to pop out, oh, look at his muscles, you know. But he was too wee. <laughs> Chief Abadou. I was born and bred in the east end of Glasgow in Canty, in the Cantine area. We used to go down the bar when I was, when I was a wee boy. The, the first memories I have of the barland is a, a black gentleman by the name of Abadou. He was a, a snake oil gentleman. He used to sell snake oil at the corner of Munkur Street and the Gibson Street, if I remember correctly. I was about 14 years of age at that time. And uh, this was a, a, an oil, a very, very small file. You got a glass file with the oil in it. You rubbed it in your hands and the smell from it was absolutely deplorable. It was rotten, like rotten eggs, for want of a better way of phrase. But he said it was snake oil, we've got to take his word. He was black, he wore a turban, but he was African-Caribbean, and African-Caribbeans don't really wear turbans, but again, it's all part of the show. But uh, he was one of the main characters. There was lots of other characters at that time. And again, as a wee boy, you're looking up to the stalls. The stalls were actually high up off the ground at the time where the, the man or the person stood to sell their goods along the front of Bunker Street. And as a wee boy, you would look up to these people and think, well, they're big men. But again, as you grew older, you became more to the same sort of level as them and realised they weren't that big, they were just big in character. It, it was very difficult in those days. This was around about 1969, 68, 69, about 18, 19 at the time. And then my friend, who, who set, actually set up the stall along with myself, we would come up with this brilliant entrepreneurial scheme. Let's get a stall at the barrows because everyone's got one there. And we got a hold of wee Alec, his name was, I can't remember wee Alec's second name. He used to come round all the stalls and demand the, the ten and six it was at that time for the stalls. But we grabbed a hold of him and we bribed him, we gave him ten shillings to himself and he found us a stall away in the corner up the stair in the, one of the markets in Stevenson Street. We had it for just under two years. We loved it because the characters you got to know and the people you got to know, and it stood me in good stead for later in life, not for they'd been in the police service, because, as I say, I became very friendly with a lot of the stallholders who, at that time, were setting out. Well, the stallholders who came to prominence in the 70s and the early 80s were all basically you know, stallholders, the same as myself in those days. There was a, a, an older gentleman who sat up the stairs, just along the, the corridor from our, ourselves, who sold the war memorabilia and coins. And a, a wise and old guy you couldn't meet, you no, know, he had half rim glasses, all the way down past his nose like that. A big moustache, went round, you no know, handlebar type moustache. Unkempt, hardly any hair, a wee bit of hair, something like Rab C. Nisbet, when you see him on television, a wee bit of hair hanging at the side. And again, uh, he would never look up, even if you were looking at his uh, goods. He would never actually look up, but he knew exactly what was going on for some reason. He always had the eyes in the top of his head. No, he was all there and a wee bit more. Uh, uh, no, right, all the way through Christmas. Uh, it's open through Christmas Eve on the Christmas morning. And that brings me on to a wee story. I was given the ta uh, task of uh, looking after the goldfish 
for one of my neighbour's children for Christmas. She was going to be given goldfish and they died on Christmas Eve, Christmas Eve night. And the wee girl was going to wake up on Christmas morning looking for her goldfish. So where are we going to find goldfish on Christmas Eve? Well, we jumped in the bus down the Barris. Thesbians coming along uh, selling their wares and trying to know that people would come in and advertise shows that were happening in the King's Theatre, shows that were happening uh, elsewhere within the other theatres in the city. So you get wee impromptu plays springing up uh, in, in the middle of Bunker Street. There was a, a guy who had the, the straight jacket type things, you know, and he would get hung upside down over the, some of the rafters and in, in the old in, in the, the the lower part of the banners, and they would get out of straight jackets. And again, you would always look at them in awe. The whole basis of of the banners was the stall holders, and the, the traders. Uh, as they, I mean, we were stall holders. Glasgow Harry and these other people were traders. We, we went in there, you no. Know, uh, because we were looking for a wee bit of extra cash, these guys were doing it for a living. So they, they were the professionals at that particular time. After we left the barras, after our two years, I sort of left the barras altogether. And I, no, because, obviously because I joined the police service uh, around about that time. And uh, I was then uh, given the beat in the, down the barras, uh, as I said previously, beat number 10 and 12. That was the, the barland area. And as I said, it became my domain. I, I ruled the roost down there. Walking the beat one night, it was night shift, and I'm walking. The barras is great when it's at night because there's not a soul about dead. No, all the ghosts walk about at that time, and it's really good. I was walking down, it was about one o'clock, half past one in the morning, walking through Munkur Street, and here's about three or four young boys, wee boys, pushing a big Churchill pram. You know the old Churchill pram, it's the big pram with the big well, the handlebars on it. I was thinking, this is strange, wee boys pushing a big pram at this time, half past one in the morning. So I went over there, I went to approach them, next minute, phew, they're off. The pram's left on its own. You know, so what do I do? Do I chase after them? I don't know what's in the pram yet, is it a child or something in the pram? So I, I don't chase after them. I walk over to the pram. And the Churchill pram, as we all know, has got a false bottom in it. Up the top of the pram, absolutely nothing there. Opens up the bottom, and here, lo and behold, it's full of whiskey bottles. Full. Full whiskey bottles. I uh, started out, oh, must have been about 20 years ago, selling earrings. That didn't work. <laughs> Wasn't very good at that. So, moved on to antiques about, I don't know, 15 years ago, something like that. And been here ever since. I love, I love the, the, the cut and thrust, the, the buying and the selling. It's great fun. It's good. And the, the people that come here are quite entertaining. <laughs> the, I used to have a stall down by the Muscle Bar and there was a guy who used to sell crockery. He was a real ticket, he was brilliant, he was funny as anything. He'd keep the, the crowd going, the jokes, and throw stuff at them and all that, and he'd catch it. And, and he was really good, he just had the brilliant part. Uh, I don't know what happened to him, he, he left oh, a good ten years ago, I think. And then there was a the butcher guy, remember the butcher guy? Yeah. There's still a guy down still there, still. Down there. One guy, but the, the, the other fella, years ago, he was he was really funny. Uh, years ago, uh, this is where people used to come to buy their stuff on a Sunday. But now, I mean, Sunday openings is commonplace as anything. I mean, the younger generation can't think, you know, like, what, you've only opened on a Sunday? You know, but it's a fact, the whole place, Glasgow was shut on a Sunday. And this was the only place it was opened, and people used to congregate here. But as the years went by and everybody opened on a Sunday, they became marginalised. Didn't have the same impact at all. Well, that's where I came in. I'm, I'm, I'm not a trader or a dealer, I'm the collector. And I, I, that's what I came out looking for. Um, special jewellery, different things, and retro clothes. I think uh -huh. that's how we all started, really. I was a collector uh -huh. until the wife told me to get, oh, get this stuff out of here. <laughs> I've well, fed I'm up this stuff in here, get rid of it. I'll say I'm the hotel so, <laughs> so, we, so we could down here and sold it, that's how it started basically. Yeah. I'll end up with a stall myself, to take away the stuff that I've already hoard. <laughs> we'll wait and see. That's, It'd that's be a shame if we lost it. Uh, Glasgow's heritage. Uh, you get a lot of people from America and Canada and all that coming over who used to be here when they were young and they always come back to the bars. Uh, That's our bigger sellers, uh, actually. The people. They get a lot of that. And even their children, mm -hmm. their parents tell them about it and they come back and have a look. <laughs> well, I came here in uh, 2000 and uh, I came in here through a friend. We, we bought furniture and then he suggested I would take over it. Pants. 
this part here, the small part, and then I spread out a bit next door, next and across the road for my Victorian China. And ever since then, I've been quite happy here. The, the bars were, were quite different. It, it, it was busier, much busier. People, I think it was for people a day out or a weekend out to, to the bars the, for the whole families. And uh, there were quite some original people and their, their patter, the barrow patter, that was quite uh, relevant. And, and you listened to them and you always had a good laugh. And, and so it, it, it was interesting. It wasn't quite as well swept as it is now, maybe. And the, the stalls were different. They were higgledy piggledy and a lot of clothes lying about in, in a heap and people used to rummage through them. Abroad, you hear about the barras. It's in the, um, the, the, the travel brochures. You find the barras mentioned. And I quite often go over to Germany and the, the travel uh, brochures do show the, the, the barras and, and talk about the barras and the, as the market, which I suppose it is. And I think Glasgow would be much poorer without it because to me, it's part of Glasgow. I came here in 1955 to Scotland through marriage and then uh, lived happily ever after. When I came here, I came down to see the bombing and the bomb dropped at a chapel and that was my introduction to the barrels. And I've been here ever since. There used to be a man over in the London Road. He sell furniture, bent good furniture. I used to help him. I used to sell the dollops over on the London Road. Dollop, that means the old clothes, you see. We used to go to Hawking during the week and sell the old clothes, the best of the old clothes over on the market. You know, companies were, aye, Dick Lee, Mr. Lee, Japanese prisoner, come back here and to know what to wear with us and that. We want to keep the bar as a laundry kin. Remember that signs like uh, a lipstick thing. And I would like to see the bar staying here. I, just, I mean, it's been pretty good, you know. I am not bad memory. This all good memory. Well, it started about 25 years ago in Skipka Pass. I started off with just bits of bric-a-brac. Um, in the old days, it was just everybody's granny come down, you know, and it, you get a lot of banter. You don't get as much of that now as you did. Um, but it's still quite good, still got a lot of old folk down and they're bringing grandkids down with them and it's good. A lot more people around, you, you've got about a third of the people now to what used to be here. It used to be five abreast the bodies, you know, and you, you just couldn't move, but it's, it's not been like that for a long time. But it's still a good place to be, the people that work here, the people that are down all the time are nice, good people. It's a friendly place, it's a nice place to be. Um, I think it'll always be here, I hope it'll always be here, but it still should be good, should be kept here. It's a, it's a part of Glasgow and it's worldwide known, we've got customers from all over the world. It'll always be, the barriers will always be here one way or another I would imagine.